Let's turn to Malachi chapter 2 and we're going to read verses 10 to 16. Malachi chapter 2 verses 10 to 16. Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, page 850 in the Pew Bibles. Don't all of us have one Father? Didn't one God create us? Why then do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has acted treacherously, and a detestable thing has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. To the man who does this, may the Lord cut off any descendants from the tents of Jacob, even if they present an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them gladly from your hands. Yet you ask, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. You've acted treacherously against her, though she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Didn't the one God make us with a remnant of his life breath? And what does that one seek? A godly offspring. So watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously against the wife of your youth. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me begin with a statement that I think everyone will agree with. Identity matters. Identity matters. Now, I don't mean in terms of identity politics, that phrase that's often thrown around in our media. I just mean basically who you are matters for all your relationships. Uh, We watched a movie last night. This is ad lib because I was thinking about it this morning. And at the heart of this movie was the search for identity. Uh, How this young child was able to work out who they are so they could understand how to relate to everyone around them. Uh, When you think about it, who you are matters because it frames your world. It defines your relationships. It displays publicly the heart of who you are. Think carefully about all the things that make up your identity, Uh, whether you're a father or a mother. Uh, whether you're older or younger, whether you're a student or a worker, whether you're retired or not, and just do a mental scroll through how all of that defines all your relationships. Conversely, you could work back the other way. You could work back from your life and ask this question. If someone was watching my relationships, my work life, my resting, what I talk about, how I talk, the way I view the world, would they know who I am? Would it reveal my identity? Well, today we're going to deal with identity. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Malachi. We only know his name. We can only take a guess at the time frame he worked in, perhaps his background, but we do know that he spoke your words. Father, thank you for their clarity. Thank you for their edge. Thank you that they bring us back to this basic truth. You love your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, The identity of God's people is made very clear here in verse 10. Don't all of us have one father? Didn't one God create us? The identity for God's people is defined by their relationship with God. And that relationship, and you'll see down a little further in verse 10, that relationship is described as a covenant. A covenant is a binding agreement between two people with mutual obligations. I agree to be in a relationship with you and we're going to do this. God chose these people by choosing their forefather, Abraham. Remember Genesis 12, we looked at it four years ago through Abraham and then through Abraham's son Isaac and then through his son Jacob, God said, I'm committed to this broken world to reverse the curse of rebellion against me through this family. 
God committed to this, not because Abraham deserved it. Uh, He was busy rebelling against God when God spoke to him. Not because Isaac deserved it. He was a weak man. Not because Jacob deserved it. God committed to him when he was still in his mum's tummy, the younger of twins, and he was a deceiver for the rest of his life. God committed to this world through this family. Why? Because of his love. His relentless, committed, unwavering, undeserved love. Remember Malachi chapter 1, verse 2? I have loved you. And that covenant between God and his people, that vertical relationship, gives them their identity. It defines them. Listen to these words from when God made his people in the book of Exodus. Moses went up the mountain to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now, if you'll listen carefully to me and carefully keep my covenant, you'll be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine. You'll be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. And what did they say in response? We'll do everything God tells us to do. That's their identity. God loves them. God saved them. God is unwaveringly committed to them. They are to be committed to their one God, one God, one people. That vertical relationship between God and his people defines them and then it seeps out everywhere they look in all their horizontal relationships, at work, at home, in leisure, when they go on holidays, in their marriages. As God's people lived in the land that he gave them, they began to doubt whether he actually loved them. And so they began to doubt their identity. And they wandered from that covenant. And God didn't wander, did he? He persistently, patiently, unfailingly sent them prophet after prophet, men and women who spoke God's words and said, hey, come back to God. He loves you. He's committed to you. You are his mob. And God's people stubbornly said, no, no, no. We don't think he loves us. And then God did exactly as he promised, didn't he? He removed them from that land. And in the exile, God's people experienced his judgment. Now he's brought them back. Remember Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 to 5? I love you. I love you. I love you. The fact that you even exist back here in the land, I love you. But as they come back to the land, what do God's people do? They look around and they go, well, the borders have shrunk. The economy is tanked. The temple is tiny. Does he really love us? Does he really care about us? Does he really care about us? And God sends them more prophets. He's already sent them Haggai. Remember we looked at Haggai last year. He now sends them Malachi. And God says to them, I love you. Remember Malachi 1, 1 to 5? But they doubt that love. And so vertically, remember what Steve talked to us about in Malachi 1, 6 to 2, 9. Vertically, what do they offer God? Because they doubt his love. They offer him the seconds, don't they? He's not really worth it because he actually doesn't really love us. And so as they doubt that vertical relationship, as they show that they doubt his love, as they show, well, everything horizontally betrays what they think, and reveals what they understand about who they are. Look there in verse 10. I'm at point three on the outline. Don't all of us have one father? Didn't one God create us? There's our identity. Why then do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Remember that identity between God and his people? One God, one people, one relationship. It's really striking how often one is used in this passage. One, 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 one. God loves them. God's committed to them. And they, well, did you see how they act there in verse 10? They act treacherously against one another. They profane, they drag through the mud the covenant of our fathers. 
put simply, God's mob are treacherous. You can't trust them. God's mob are unfaithful. God's mob profane their relationship with each other. Put bluntly, their identity is being displayed and their exclusive relationship with God is not being expressed in how they deal with each other. No one's exempt. Do you notice the us and the we there? It's not as if Malachi's standing on the outside pointing the finger. Malachi's in the mob going, that's us. And the words of the Lord are relentless here. Look down there in verse 11. Judah has acted treacherously. A detestable thing has been done in Israel and Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary, which he loves. One, 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 treacherous, treacherous, treacherous. <laughs> Do you see the contrast? God is faithful. Well, what do God's people do? I, I don't think he really loves us. So we're going to do what we like in all of our relationships <laughs> because we don't think God loves us. What have, what have the Lord's people done that's so offensive, that's so faithless, that is so treacherous? Did you see it there or did you hear it in verse 11? Let me read verse 11 again. Judah has acted treacherously. A detestable thing has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary, which he loves. It must be terrible. And has married the daughter of a foreign god. Married the daughter of a foreign god. Now, it's worth slowing down here to make sure we understand what is happening in this accusation from the Lord. Oh, that's the way Malachi works. There's an accusation, there's a response from God's people, and there's an application. We, we're here in the first accusation, and we need to slow down at this point so we don't misunderstand what is being said. First, remember our series on God and sex? Marriage is a reflection of the nature of God. It not only displays his character, but as God speaks to his people, and we'll see this in verse 15, God has actually said, marriage is going to display my covenant with you. I'm giving you a daily living, breathing covenant that you'll see everywhere in your communities that will remind you of your identity with me. And it's the marriage covenant. And it displays God's relationship with his people. Second, as God has given his people this land, He's expressly forbidden them to marry the daughters of foreign gods. Did you hear that in Deuteronomy 7 that Elizabeth brought us? Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons because they'll turn your sons away from me to worship other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you. He'll swiftly destroy you. Instead, this is what you are to do to them. Tear down their altars, smash their standing pillars, cut down their Asherah poles, burn up their carved images. Here's your identity. For you are a holy people belonging to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his own possession out of all the people on the face of the earth. It's the same in Exodus 34 verse 16. To marry the daughter of a foreign god is not an issue of ethnicity. <laughs> it's not an issue of marrying across cultural boundaries. It's a statement of identity. They follow one god and God's mob are exclusively devoted to him. And so as God's people marry the daughters of foreign gods or the sons of foreign gods, they're actually making a public statement about their identity, about their covenant with God. In this daily covenant of marriage, God's people are saying publicly, we don't think God loves us. We're not committed to an exclusive relationship with him. We doubt whether his love is sufficient and his devotion is for us. And so we're going to disobey. We're going to do what we want. In essence, they're saying publicly, our God is one of a number of gods. And his exclusive covenant with us doesn't matter. There's a community-wide culpability and impact here. The culpability comes because everyone knows what's going on and no one says a thing. And the impact is clear because what these people are doing in their marriages 
is dragging God's name through the mud and dirtying his house. Did you notice the judgment there in verse 12? Look there in verse 12. To the man who does this, may the Lord cut off any descendants from the tents of Jacob, even if they present an offering to the Lord of hosts. Do you notice that it's a prayer? (laughs) May. Malachi is actually praying here and saying, God, can you bring this judgment down? Do you notice how serious this judgment is? In the eyes of God, Marriage matters because it is a daily, living, breathing, horizontal example of God's relationship with his people. If you want to see what happens when people actually take this seriously, look at Ezra 9 to 10. Look at Nehemiah 10 and 13. These people actually think they can hide it. Did you see that down in verses 12 and 13? Even if they present an offering to the Lord of hosts, and this is another thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them gladly from your hands. So long as I keep my religious observance up to scratch, it doesn't matter what I do in my marriage. I can come to God with my tears and offer him my seconds for sacrifice. Hang on. He's not accepting it. Do you see their response in verse 14? Yet you ask, for what reason? Point four on the other. Why won't you take my seconds, God? And then God moves into his second accusation, which carries on the focus. He highlights another area of their acting treacherously. Point five on the outline, look at verse 14. Yet you ask, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. You've acted treacherously against her, though she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. The Lord gave these men and women marriage. It is a gift horizontally of a daily covenant that shows how much God loves his people, how their identity is in him. God gave them this. He's their witness at their marriages. Can you imagine God sitting down at that table and signing the documents? That's the language here. He's in the bridal party. He's a witness legally. He signed the papers. And what have they done with God as their witness? They've played fast and loose with their marriages. They've divorced whenever they've kind of, ah, no longer in love anymore. But gee, that daughter of a foreign god. In the same way that God's people have acted treacherously by marrying people who follow other gods, so they've done the same in their own marriages and revealed how much they value those covenants. It's not worth it as they've been quick to divorce, as they've been quick to turn their back on God, as they've been quick to move on. God's people are saying, we don't value the covenant with God. We're not in an exclusive relationship with him. We doubt whether God's love has our best interests at heart. So we're going to directly disobey the very God we're meant to be committed to. In fact, if you look at verse 15, they're destroying God's intention for marriage. Look there in verse 15. Didn't the one God make us with a remnant of his life breath? What does that one God seek? A godly offspring. God gave the marriage. God breathed marriage to them. So there was a daily living, breathing, covenantal example in their towns to say this is who we are. And then it actually destroys the next generation of covenant keepers because as those kids watch their parents dissolve marriages through divorce because, well, the kids go, is God worth it? Mum and dad don't trust him. Mum and dad don't think he's sufficient. Mum and dad don't think he's worth following. Why should I? And so the next generation of the covenant is destroyed. God himself despises the behaviour he's confronting here through Malachi and he despises the fake piety. Look there in verse 16. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore watch yourselves carefully. Do not act treacherously. My heart always sinks when I read verses like this, not just because of the content but when the commentators say this is the trickiest verse in the whole Old Testament. 
You go, oh, strike a light burner's going to sort that in a week, isn't he? It's tricky for a number of reasons, but I think it's helpful for us to see this as a mirror of verse 13 because it uses the same language. God is sick of them profaning the daily covenant and then trying to cover it up with religious piety. God hates divorce like this. It's quick and easy, easy come, easy go divorce. That reveals the low view God's people have of their relationship with him. And then he hates it when they try to cover it up with violence. And the word violence there is the word used for sacrifice in verse 13. And so the same pattern is happening. We can play fast and loose with the covenant so long as we make sure our religious observance is up to scratch. We can play fast and loose with the covenant so long as we cover it up with our sacrifices and their seconds anyway. And God says, I'm tired of this. Not just I'm tired of this, I despise this. And do you notice his exhortation there in verses 15 and 16? Do you know what he says to his people? Watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. You notice he repeats that? Examine your hearts. Watch your behaviour. Because what you are doing horizontally reveals your identity with me. What you are doing in your marriages reveals what you view of me. It's pretty bleak, isn't it? (laughs) It's a very bleak exposure of God's people as they stand in that land and they doubt God loves them. Their identity is defined by God. You're my mob. I am relentlessly committed to you in my love that is costly. I am bound to you. You are exclusively mine. And, well, they doubt God's love, don't they? And so as they doubt that love vertically, what happens horizontally with all their covenants? Well, with the covenant of marriage. It expresses their disdain for God. They profane it and they abuse his covenant. Is is there a chance of anyone being faithful in that covenant? Is there a chance of anyone relating rightly to God and so relating rightly horizontally, every single relationship showing who they are? Well, there is hope, isn't there? Therefore, since we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, what's his name? Jesus, the Son of God. Let's hold fast to the confession, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who's been tested in every way as we are, yet without what? Without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. There there is one who's faithful, isn't there? There is one who vertically understood that exclusive covenant and lived it in every horizontal relationship. Can you imagine Jesus in his carpenter's workshop? because he was a carpenter for 18 years before he did his public ministry, and everyone who walked in there goes, I I know the identity of that bloke. Look how he conducts himself as a carpenter. Surely that bloke's the son of God. And Jesus walks in front of John the Baptist, and what does John the Baptist say in John chapter 1? Just the way he walks, that man's the son of God. And when Jesus sits down with tax collectors and sinners and says, The sick need a doctor. What do they say about him? Well, they come to him in droves, don't they? And when he dies on a cross and says, Father, into your hands I give my spirit, what does the Roman centurion say? Surely this man was the... So he ran his carpenter's workshop. He walked, he talked, he ate, he drank, he died. And when everyone looked at all of those things, what do they say about him? Here's a man defined by God. Here's a man faithful in the covenant. Here's a man who never doubted the love of God, even to the point of dying and saying, God, I trust you, and so I put my spirit in your hands. What did God do three days later? Exercised great power and raised him from the dead. Was God's love to be trusted? 
It was. In every relationship it was displayed. And do you notice in those three readings that I just brought us from Hebrews 4, 2 Corinthians and 1 Peter, what's the result of that? People who doubt the love of God can come into the presence of God. We are actually given his faithfulness and brought into the presence of God, forgiven. Jesus describes it in Luke 22 as a new covenant created by his blood. God takes upon himself the obligations of the first covenant and then he fulfills them for us so we can be his people. Faithless as we are, we now have Jesus' faithfulness. And that provides our identity, doesn't it? That vertical thing. That provides our identity. And so nothing changes for God's people. As our identity is found vertically through Jesus, through his faithfulness with God who is now our Father, our horizontal relationships show that, especially in the covenant of marriage. So what does that mean? I'm at the last point on the outline. What does that mean? Firstly, let me say it means that our fundamental primary identity is what? It's defined by God. We are God's mob. Saved by the blood of Jesus, granted his faithfulness, knowing that God loves us relentlessly. And nothing can separate us from that love. If we are one of God's mob, that is who we are. Secondly, our identity is seen in how we live horizontally and especially in the daily covenant of marriage. Marriage has been created by God to reflect both his nature and to be a living, breathing example of the covenant he has with his people. If God does love us, and he does, if God has shown us his love by sending his son to be faithful for us and to save us, and he does, then our marriages must reflect our identity as God's mom. Our marriages must display the truth that we know and trust, that God loves us and his love is sufficient and will never let us down and is relentlessly committed and so we must watch ourselves and not act treacherously, mustn't we? For those who are waiting for marriage, That means trust that God loves you and will provide the spouse you need within his design. We display that in our dating or in our courtship by not dating or marrying those who don't know Jesus. That's very clear. For those in marriage, we display our identity as people loved by God by being living, breathing examples of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. At the heart of our marriages is what Jesus did for us on the cross. And what does that look like in the nitty-gritty, grimy stuff of every day? Well, let me suggest that God's word needs to be somewhere near the centre of our marriages, doesn't it? Not just sitting there on the coffee table, but opened daily. Let me suggest that in our marriages, we're devoted to displaying Jesus so that the next generation of covenant keepers goes, ah, God does love his people. And in our marriages, the way we talk and communicate about our marriages displays the goodness of the God who gave them to us. For those who might be in marriages where someone doesn't follow Jesus, the same applies. Keep displaying your identity as someone loved by God in Jesus Christ. Finally, let me make very clear that in Jesus being the only person faithful in the covenant, we have all the forgiveness we can ever need. There is no unforgivable sin in this except the rejection of Jesus. And so if you have been broken 
by the damage of divorce or marriage that isn't working the way God designed, then there is complete and utter restoration in the one who was faithful for us. And so what should we do? Well, we should do what we learn in Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Look at the cross, it's empty. Look at the tomb, no one can put him back. Look at the right hand of God, and there is seated the one who loves you relentlessly, gave his life so that you can be forgiven for any, any rebellion. Let me pray. Father, we've said a number of times that Malachi has a hard edge, but in that hard edge we have the blood of grace. Father, thank you for your relentless, committed, exclusive love for your people that sent your son to bear the obligations of the covenant for both sides so that we could be proven faithful and come back to you. Father, please enable us to show this covenant in our daily covenant of marriage. Father, please forgive us when we do not watch ourselves carefully. Father, please make this a community of broken people who know your grace and are showing the goodness of that to the whole world because we know that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.